Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 249 and 250, which read as follows. Dadati ve yatha sadhang yatha pasadhanang jano Tatha yo ja manku hoti pare sang pana bhojane Na so diwawa ratting wa samadhi madigachati Yasa jetang samuchinang Mula ghatjang samuhatang Sa ve diwawa ratting wa samadhi madigachati Which means People give according to their faith, according to their conviction. Whoever becomes disturbed or upset by that, by the giving of food and drink by others, or by the food and drink of others, such a person, whether at night, by day or by night, does not attain samadhi, focus or concentration. Whoever has removed this, cut it off, uprooted it completely, eradicated it, that, that person indeed by day or by night, does attain to samadhi. These two verses were taught in response to the story of a certain monk, a novice, sorry, <clears throat> who was apparently very critical of any gift given to the to the monastics. He was critical of, they say, Anatta Pindika's gifts. Anatta Pindika was the great supporter of the Buddha who gave so much of his wealth and supported the Buddha quite quite intently. Quite 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 intently. And he would criticize Visaka, the chief female lay disciple of the Buddha who was equally kind and generous and supportive of, of the Buddha's religion when he, they say it says when, when they got hot food he would complain it was too hot when they got cold food he would say it should be hot no matter what people gave to the monks he was always complaining but his reason for complaining seems to have not been because he disliked what was given. It seems that he disliked or or he uh, felt threatened by the giving because he would always brag about his own family. When Whenever anyone supported the monks, the story goes that he would always compare it to his family and say... My family gives so much better than this. My relatives, my kinsmen, my people. It's a peculiar story, but bear with me. There's a point to it. And so the monks thought, wow, this, this, this is really interesting. I mean, if true, this is a big deal. This, this guy's family is something special for him to disdain any, any other person doing such great deeds as giving gifts to others or being charitable, you know. And so they went to the village where this monk, this novice was from and, and they asked around about some great family who who gave such great gifts and who was generous and charitable in this city and the the wealthy people of the city said, we don't know of such a person. And they said, but there is this gatekeeper 
guy the guy who 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 guards the the gate of the city he had a son named Tissa who who the, the, this had the same name as this novice who who went forth as a novice so they went and they went to the family they found out sure enough this was his his family it was a very poor family who never really didn't didn't ever give anything or or was never of any great charity and so they went to the buddha and they brought this up to the buddha that this samanera was really 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 talking without any basis and the buddha taught these verses in response he said oh this this samanera this is just the way he's been from lifetime after lifetime he talked about the samanera's past lives and then he said it's just how he always has been and then he pivots and he teaches these verses so to understand the importance of of this subject and and why it's an instructive story you have to get an idea of the the world that buddhist monks live in we live impoverished when we don't take salaries we're not allowed to work for a living um for intent, all intents and purposes, we're 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 without. We are to be content with nothing. The allowance to receive gifts is just that—an an allowance as an exception to stay alive. Not not to be sought out, not to be coerced or 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 um, fussed over, but to be accepted as an allowance. So when Monks uh, wake up in the morning in order to gain food to survive. They are allowed to walk mindfully without any begging or asking or even hinting, without even showing their bowl. Walk through the village, and if someone is giving alms or interested in giving alms, then they're allowed to take it. That's the point. So the idea of giving food to the monks is it's the whole of the realm of, of economy for monks, of livelihood, you might say. And so it's equivalent to what we might think of in a worldly and in, in a non-monastic setting of livelihood, working for a living. And if you understand the parallel, if you see the, the, that as the parallel, then you can get an idea of where this is coming from. This is a guy who was obsessed over his livelihood. And so for monks, because we don't have money, because we don't have any of the trappings of employment or society, that lay people do. This is what monks obsess about. They obsess about who's giving what and so on. And usually it's on the other side. Usually I would find it's much more about are they giving to me? What are they giving to me? And it seems that, you know, to this monk's credit, he wasn't greedy. He was just conceited and, and, and deceitful, really, which is bad enough. But uh, he was boasting about something that wasn't true. Perhaps he felt... Uh, he felt low self-esteem or, or somehow uh, trying to overcompensate for his lack of, of uh, wealthy upbringing or something. It's a strange story, as I said, but it underlines this important concept of, of obsession and, and disturbance in the mind. And so it, it works on, on both sides of this issue. On the one side... Uh, being disturbed by the the activities of others it's a very common thing to see where we get upset when we see others doing things we perceive as being uh, improper you know, critical of others so we, we're critical of other people when they try to do their best when we see someone there's this this term that you hear called virtue signaling uh, and People who use this term, they, they, they're critical of people who appear to be professing uh, virtues, professing good things. And they'll say, oh, that's just virtue signaling. I mean, that person really doesn't mean it. And so it seems to be a bit of an obsession for people to point out the inadequacies of others. This, this, uh, act, this mind state is a very important one where we obsess about the, idea, the, the activities of others. We obsess about the workings of other people. It, it's an essential uh, pitfall of one's own mental development. It's something that 
will constantly obstruct and hinder our path towards true peace of mind because we are externalizing things. We're, we're, we're living in a realm where uh, the answers to our problems are without any concrete basis in reality because they, they deal with other people. Is this person really uh, virtuous or are they just um, pretending? You'll never find a true answer to that because you're dealing with people. You're looking at, is this person a good person? When people aren't the things that really exist. Because what exists, of course, is just experience. And on the other side, as I mentioned, it, it, our obsession is often about our own gains. So when we see this, this, this verse without the story includes a broader picture of, of the obsession with any topic around livelihood. For, for example, as I said, what you gain for yourself. People who are obsessed with other people's salaries, salaries, is this person getting more than me? The obsession with uh, class warfare, or class uh, inequality, you know, talking about demanding, uh, demanding uh, equality in the world, of taxing the rich, eating the rich is something you hear, which I'm not sure what exactly that means, but, uh, and, and blaming rich people, which... The point, the point here is not whether it, it's true or not whether it, anyone is truly to blame or not. The point is, and this is what the verse uh, focuses on, hones in on, the verse doesn't even condemn the monk. It, it in fact, perhaps uh, implicitly condemns the monks who came to the Buddha by saying, you know, when, you're, when you're concerned with other people, when you're concerned with the doings of others, You'll never attain concentration. So these, even these monks who came to the Buddha, maybe they did a good thing, but it's also quite possible to understand that they were barking up the wrong tree as well by concerning themselves with this monk. So the Buddha takes this story and he pivots to point out what's really important. Why is it wrong to be focused on the, the deeds of others? It's not a matter of whether they're doing wrong or they're, or they're doing right. Uh, it's not a matter of whether you're right to do it or not, right to right to criticize others or not. The point and the real important lesson is that it disturbs samadhi. It's a very simple thing. It disturbs your mind. It, it interrupts the clarity and, and the, the, the purity of your mind. It, it interrupts your process of mental development. So how it relates to our practice should be fairly obvious and, and I think one way that it relates to our practice specifically is the, it makes the link between the worldly and the spiritual or the, the internal and the external. You can't live your life focused on externalities. As an example, criticizing the, the activities of others and expect to really understand and and come to turn come to peace with your own experience there there are two different ways of looking at the world and so you you see this a, a problem in many aspects of our life husbands and wives critical of each other parents critical of children children critical of parents like we're critical of other Ethnic groups or or other groups in in society, class class warfare and so on. Politics, where where uh, this party and that party, sports teams even. Oh, sports teams is a whole other issue, but we live our lives in externalities, concerned with the workings of others. So our practice of meditation can well be described as the abandoning, the uprooting of this whole perspective, this whole way of looking at, at, at reality in terms of what people are doing and the right and wrong of people's activities, the better and the worse, 
of people. Through the practice of mindfulness, we come to see the good and the bad of experiences, of reactions, of mind states. How the real issues that we're faced with are all related to our experience and our reactions to our experience, our, our internal process of cognition, of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. When we focus on these, any idea of what others might be doing, the right and the wrong of criticism, fades away. And because it's real in a way that people and, and actions are not, it creates a, a, a energy, a, a life, a, a live liveliness because of the simplicity and the purity and the reality, the, 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 the not needing to engage in abstract and complicated thoughts of people being right and positions and, 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 and comparisons between positions and comparisons between actions. The Buddha's teaching, many, many of the Buddha's teachings are so very simple, they're often, the depth of them is often overlooked. They're often mistaken as simplistic teachings. But the simplicity of them is a, a huge part of the teaching because it creates a pure and a clear state of mind when, when you have a, a simple simple perspective of seeing things just as they are when when seeing is just seeing and hearing is just hearing you you're in a whole other universe you're in a whole other dimension there's no more comparisons with others there's no more worrying about who gave what or 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 no to extrapolate for those who are not monastic who gets what who does what in society and in work someone told me recently about having to compete in a in in a job with another company and the other company not playing fair If you live in that world, you're always going to be faced with worry and, and uncertainty. You can never really be certain because of the very nature of it. Because, because people and society and employment and, and economy and so on are all conceptual. They're removed from what's actually going on behind the scenes. You can never really predict accurately what's going to happen. You can never be stable or sure because it's not real. When you finally come to focus on reality, on experience, well, you come to see that experience is chaotic but dependable. It will always just be seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking. When you live in that way, when you live in that realm, your your foundation is secure. Your interactions will be without any surprises. There will always be a, a familiarity, a certainty, an unshakable knowledge and understanding. Because there can never be more than the, than those simple momentary experiences. So a simple lesson. Um, one of the teachings in the Dhammapada, but it gives us a, a important reminder, like many of the teachings, of not only uh, what's the right way and the wrong way to behave, but why it's important. Not because it's right or or just, but because it it is supportive, and because it has positive benefits to your psyche 
because it is psychologically beneficial. So that's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you for listening.